Hi guys, welcome back. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to paint a model from the Lord of the Rings miniatures game. And a lot of viewers have been asking me about this. Lord of the Rings is very popular, and I'm also a huge fan myself. I've loved Lord of the Rings since I was a kid. I've read all the books seven times, and the Silmarillion, and all of that stuff. So I've wanted to do it. I just never really had a model available, and I never really, or for whatever reason, or got around to getting one. And nowadays, of course, it's a bit harder because I think Games Workshop has kind of discontinued the main miniature range. Uh, and there is still some things, I think, available through Forge World, but obviously it's, I think, less of a selection, and their stuff is super-duper expensive, of course. Uh, luckily, my friend Emil had some of the older models laying around, and he gave me one of those to paint, so thanks for that, Emil. Um, this is uh, a, a um, King of Gondor named Elendil. Um, he doesn't factor very much into the main story. He's kind of mentioned, though. Uh, if you watch the films, he appears at the very, very beginning of the first movie. Uh, he is in the first War of the Ring, one of the leaders, and he's killed by Sauron, and as a result, his son Isildur, who you may have heard of in Revenge, uh, strikes down Sauron and then takes the One Ring, but instead of him destroying it, he keeps it for himself, which uh, doesn't work out well for him because he is then subsequently killed. Uh, he loses the ring, and then it's found by Smeagol slash Gollum, and, you know, that all kicks off the events of the book. So, he's just wearing the very classic armor uh, and uh, sort of livery that you see the sort of Gondorian men wearing, at least uh, in Peter Jackson's sort of film version of the book. But I like how he's kind of conceptualized a lot of the races and factions in Middle-earth. So, I'm looking forward to painting this. They, he's wearing a very sort of heroic-looking... Uh, heavy, high medieval, gothic kind of plate armor that's really, really shiny. And then you've got the black and silver livery of Gondor with the tree and everything, which is really, I think, is a, is a, is a kind of a striking and really beautiful kind of uh, fantasy image. And as I said, I am a huge fan of everything Lord of the Rings, so, uh, you know, if I can get a hold of more figures, I hope I can paint some more of this stuff in the future, because I'd also love to cover, like, elves and orcs, and maybe even some of the characters and heroes that, you know, figure uh, really big in the story. Okay, so here to start off with are all the paints that you're going to need to complete this model. Obviously, I'm not including the skin tones, but they're really actually minimal on this figure because they're all hidden underneath the helmet. Uh, you can see there's also some glaze medium there, and that comes in handy for a couple of things that we're going to be doing later. All right, so I'm going to start out by working on the inside of Elendil's cloak. Uh, I had a certain amount of trouble finding uh, references for him online because, or at least of the movie version of him that this figure is based on. Uh, but it looked like from some other people who painted this model, the cloak inside is kind of a creamy, kind of white shade. So that's what I'm going to be going with too. Um, I'm applying a base coat here of Iraqi sand from Vallejo, and you'll need a couple of coats to get sufficient coverage. Once I've got a nice solid base coat on there, I'm gonna go ahead and mix the Iraqi sand about 50-50 with Vallejo Ivory, and I'm gonna apply that as my first highlight. I'm keeping my paint pretty thin and just building up lots and lots of layers because this is really light and that means the paint's gonna be really transparent and you're gonna just really gonna have to keep building it up a lot. Uh, I'm obviously only gonna be leaving the Iraqi sand as it is in the very sort of deepest shadows kind of along his body. For my second highlight on the cloak, I'm then just going to graduate to pure Vallejo Ivory. And again, same thing, keeping it thin and applying layers. I tend to apply the thickest paint to the tops of wrinkles and creases and folds in the cloak and then sort of blend it out and pull it out from there. And then just do that over the entire area and then just keep repeating the process and just keep building it up so you're going to get those really strong lights on the, really the sort of the high areas of the fabric and then the color sort of is more gradual and a lot sort of thinner in some of the more slightly shaded areas. For my final highlight in the interior of the cloak, I'm using pure white. And the main reason I'm doing this is because these colors are so subtle and sort of the transition sort of difference between the shades being used here is so little that I felt like I needed another brighter color just to get sort of enough contrast and kind of enough range of color. I'm 
gonna be applying the white again thinly, but I'm not gonna apply it everywhere. I'm really gonna focus it on the tops of the wrinkles and creases and really build it up a lot in those areas, but then keep it thin everywhere else and really blend it out so that we, you know, or at least you can sort of see some sort of shadow. And it is true with this cloak, the way the wrinkles and creases fall, there's not gonna be any areas in really deep shadow that you have to worry about. So all in all, you're gonna want the whole thing to have a pretty subtle effect. So the outside of Elendil's cloak is very clearly black. So I'm just gonna start out here by applying a base coat of black. Uh, you need to be a little bit careful here to make sure that the edges are smooth and even and you've got a nice sort of line where it transitions between the white lining and the black, especially since there's such a big difference and it's so easy to mess that up. So, you know, just really take your time when you're doing the edge part of this just to make sure that it looks nice. Okay, since I think uh, knowing how to paint black is something a lot of people are really interested in. I'm gonna go ahead and slow this segment down for you a bit from now on so you can really see how I'm doing my blending work. And I really do want this cloak to appear black and not sort of gray, <laughs> like I kind of end up with occasionally because of my overzealous highlighting. So I'm doing my best here. Anyway, the first highlight I'm applying to the cloak here is gonna be a mixture of black with about 50-50 uh, German gray in there, all Vallejo colors. And I'm also going to add just a slight hint of blue in there, just a, a few dabs, just to give it a slight cast there. And also because the, uh, I think the black that you see uh, the Gondorites, Gondorians uh, wearing is sort of a black blue. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense. So I've just added a couple drops of uh, Vallejo Prussian blue in there to get that effect, but you could use other shades as well. It's, we're putting so little in, it doesn't make a lot of difference. But with this first uh, layer, you can see I'm just very carefully uh, layering that color on the tops of all the creases and folds in the cloak. Uh, you've got some much more extreme creasing going on here than on the inner uh, surface. So it's it's much easier to kind of lay this along the top and then leave the inner uh, or sort of more folded areas, just the pure black uh, color here. My second highlight on the black cloak, cloak here is gonna be pure German gray this time. Well, not pure because again, I have put just a dab of that Prussian blue in there to keep my sort of blue tone going. And I'm just gonna go back over uh, as I did with the last layer and sort of apply it to the tops of the wrinkles and folds. Uh, the, the first highlight we painted was a, kind of tricky to apply because it was so dark, it's, you couldn't really see it, what you were putting down for the most part. So that makes it hard, but with the German gray, there you can at least sort of perceive a very subtle difference in tone so it's easier to know where to direct your brush uh, and you know be precise with it uh, i'm keeping my paint nice and smooth here and transparent not only because it's easier to apply you know smooth clear lines but also uh, you know i want it to be transparent so that it blends out sort of nicely into the darker uh, shadow areas uh, and again, remember, even with these dark colors, you can definitely build up more layers to get sort of the tops of your wrinkles and folds uh, lighter. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you'll want to apply your paint to the tops of the creases uh, first, so that that's where the brightest color is, and, you know, then sort of blend them out a little bit sort of down into those deeper folds. For the third highlight, I've taken my uh, German gray that had a little bit of that blue in there and I've just now added just the tiniest, teeniest dab of white into that. It has to be a really, really small amount because when you're lightening uh, grays, a little white will go a really, really long way. Uh, so go real, real slow because you don't want the step to be very bit much at all. And, and then you probably want to add in a little bit more of the blue as necessary to make sure you keep your blue tone. But now that I've got this ever so slightly lighter gray, just a little bit lighter than the German gray that I had before, I'm just going again back over the tops of the folds and creases with my color uh, and applying it. Uh, at this stage, for, once you get past uh, just the pure German gray, all the sort of 
additional highlights above that, you should try not to apply them to too broad of areas of the cloak. You can see I'm really just reinforcing the sharpest folds and creases, kind of the tops of those areas where, you know, it really folds in some of those bigger, smoother, uh, flat areas on the side. Uh, I'm not going to apply uh, too much of it of this uh, level of highlight there, or if I do, I'm going to make sure it's really thin and really kind of blends out a lot. And now for my final highlight on the cloak, I've just gone ahead and added even more of my white in. Well, even more, I should say. The amount I add was very, very tiny once again, but it's again just slightly lighter than what I was doing before. And I'm really taking care as of the last step, but even more so to really uh, focus this on the sharp uh, creases and folds and really make sure it blends out from there. This is really just to give emphasis because, you know, when black is hit by light, uh, it's the sort of the tops of sharp creases and folds that are going to appear kind of more gray looking. So that's where you want to uh, focus your lighter tones. And you need to be careful though that you, this gray, this final highlight is not too light though because if you do that you're going to get an effect where the thing is starting to start to look shiny like it's made out of rubber or metal or something or not metal rubber or leather or something like that which is obviously not what we're going for here so that's why you need to make sure that your your color steps are not too great So my final uh, step for the cloak is to apply a black glaze. Uh, that's what that glaze medium was for. All you do is you take some glaze medium and you add some black into it. A little bit will go a long way here. Uh, you don't want it to be too dark and too concentrated because that kind of defies the point of a glaze. Uh, so what you're going to do once you've got your glaze is you're going to be applying it specifically into the dark and shadowed areas of the cloak and sort of then blending it uh, f from there uh, up into the lighter areas. Um, this is a really great way to make sure you've got smoother, nicer transitions from the lighter colors uh, to the darker colors. And it's also really good if you've got some areas you feel like you over-highlighted, you've got too light gray, you can use this to really sort of tone them down and bring them back into that darker base that you want. And just, you know, it adds sort of a filter over top of those light grays. And the whole effect is just going to be a lot more black. And the nice thing about the glazes is you can apply uh, multiple layers of them to get darker and darker tones down in the recesses and it's just overall a really handy nice thing to do it, it, it and unlike washes glazes will really stay put for you so you apply a wash it tends to run and it flows maybe in areas where you don't want but a wash will go exactly where you want it to go and you can blend it out really easily um, and the con and the sort of the pigmentation is going to be really even uh, and smooth if you do it with it with a good brush like I'm using uh, right here and also it doesn't dry very quickly I mean that is to say it doesn't dry as fast as normal paint so you've got more time to sort of play with it and move it around and sort of get it smooth on the figure and kind of where you want it so uh, sometimes I admit that it can be annoying if you if you want to move on to the next step and your glaze isn't dry but generally it's um it's just a really helpful technique for something like this when you're working with these dark colors. Uh, I actually used this too when I was painting a Batman figure some months back. Uh, he's a little bit bigger scale, but if you want more on painting sort of black clothing and especially uh, black cloaks, you might want to check out what I did with him because I worked a lot more there with the black glaze. And that's just because it's a bigger model and you, got, you just need an overall smoother effect and you need to spend more time sort of sort of transitioning all your areas together. Uh, Ellendale is small enough that this shouldn't be too laborious a process. Now I'm going to be painting the chain mail. Those are some really small areas on this model, but I've just mixed up kind of a, a combination of black 
into which I've added a little bit of Vallejo Air uh, gunmetal, and that's my base coat here. You want it to mostly be sort of a very dark, sort of metallic shade. And from this point on, where pretty much everything I'm going to be doing is with the number uh, zero brush, just because there's so much fine detail on the armor and the clothing. If you use anything bigger, you're not going to get very good control. Once that base coat is on, I'm going to apply a pretty generous wash of Nolan Oil from Citadel just to get more emphasis down in all those creases and tiny cracks in the armor. And once that's dry, then you want to go back over and sort of overbrush lightly just with pure gunmetal just to build up your shine on that surface. Next thing is Ellen Dill's wearing kind of a sort of red skirt-like piece, I guess, around the bottom of his armor. Uh, and it's very clear from all the stills of him in the movie that this should be red, but a very dark red. So uh, what I've done here is taken some black and I've mixed in some Vallejo black red. And you can see it's a very, very dark tone. And I'm just going to be carefully applying that to the entire area. Uh, it's very, very likely when you're doing this that at some point and you're gonna get some red onto your white uh, because it's just hard to edge it perfectly. Don't panic if that happens. It's easy to go back in and fix it later with a few dabs of ivory. I'm then going to continue highlighting the red skirt area by taking pure Vallejo black red and then just sort of laying or it, layering it over my base here. Again, you can see I'm building it up gradually so that we get an extra definition and a bigger range of colors. Next, I'm going to apply a highlight, which is a mixture of Citadel um, Mephiston Red, 50-50 with the um, black red from the last step. Same deal, I'm just building it up uh, in many layers on top of that jacket, adding sort of gradual highlights. And once that's on there, I'll just repeat the process, but then with just pure Mephiston Red on top. I always start by focusing on the t on the edges of the fabric and the tops of any sort of folds or creases, even if they're very light and sort of subtle like they are in this particular case. Always start with the tops of those, uh, apply the heaviest color, build up the most layers there, and then just kind of pull the paint out from that point. I'm going to finish off highlighting the red now using uh, Evil Sun Scarlet, again from Citadel. I'm keeping the paint real thin here uh, so that it doesn't build up too fast because again this is supposed to be a dark red and I don't actually want it to get too too bright here but nonetheless I am going to apply uh, several layers and again really focusing on the edges and the tops of the wrinkles and creases uh, with some uh, situations where I'm painting red after I finish this I'll mix an even lighter sort of uh, pinkish shade which I'll use as kind of an edge highlight or just for extreme creases but because the, the, the creases and folds in this are so gentle and also because I want this to appear to be a rather dark red I am NOT going to be adding in any sort of extra sort of extreme pinkish highlights Now this bit, next bit is kind of some extreme detail work, and honestly, it's, it's it's so fiddly that you could quite simply skip it, and you would probably not see, and it wouldn't make very much difference. But sort of the top sort of bit of his skirt there, there's sort of two pieces to it, has a trim on it, which is sort of this gold embroidery against a black background. And because he's got those armored wings coming down, you don't really see very much of this on the model. It's just kind of there a little bit on the sides, uh, but I'm gonna paint it anyway. So uh, I'm gonna, after uh, getting the sort of the base areas uh, painted with black, I'm then gonna go ahead and take some German camouflage black brown from um, Vallejo. And I'm gonna mix that with some Averlin Sunset from Citadel to get this very dark brown yellow color. And I'm gonna use a fine brush to carefully uh, fine line the edges of that and also add some sort of decoration work in the middle. I'm then going to go back over it first starting with pure Averlin Sunset though I've got the paint kind of thinned down here because it is a base color so it tends to be pretty heavy and I'm just going to very carefully go back over those sort of border and decorative elements that I created and start building up some highlights here. We're going for sort of a very a basic non-metallic metal effect here because as you may know my feelings on cloth embroidery if you're using metallic thread you should probably be doing that with a non-metallic metal effect just because metallic paint tends to look kind of weird and that's doubly true here because we are going to have a lot of areas of legitimately uh, shiny metal. 
I'm going to finish up the highlighting process now by first mixing my Averland Sunset in with a bit of Vallejo Ivory to create a very light yellow shade. And I'm again going back in and at this point really just sort of picking out select areas on my embroidery detail to make it look like there's a little bit of shine here. Uh, and you can build it up more in some areas, keep it a little bit stronger just so that you get this uh, sort of highlighted look. You, ideally, you're probably going to want to focus these lighter colors in the middle of the uh, embroidery patches on either side and then let it be uh, darker much darker towards the sides because that's you know that's just how the modeling looks here it's going to make sense it's going to look like the shine hits there and then it's in the shadows i also finished off with some dots of just pure vallejo ivory just to add that really extreme reflective look to the top now obviously one of the biggest elements on this model is the shiny armor and I'm going to be tackling that next. So I'm creating a base coat here and that's going to be a mixture of uh, black again with the gunmetal. Though in this case I've made the base color a little bit uh, less dark than I did on the chainmail and that's because we want this armor to end up be very very shiny looking ultimately so uh, it makes sense then not to start with quite such a dark base. Because the metal is such a huge element here, you really want to apply maybe more highlight layers than you would on smaller bits and build it up a little bit more gradually. So now I've taken that mixture of black and gunmetal and I've just added in a bit more gunmetal to get it slightly uh, more metallic and I'm just going back over all the areas and building it up again. There's a lot of fine detail sculpting here with the wings and stuff, so you wanna make sure uh, you use a really small brush here and keep your paint nice and thin. Uh, at this point, I'm not too worried if I get my color sort of down in the recesses and shade, the recesses and cracks uh, between the bits of armor. We'll go and fix all of that later and make sure there's more contrast there. And now for my next highlight, I've moved on to just pure Vallejo Air Gunmetal, uh, which I'm still going to be building up over all the areas and as I said in the last step you still don't need to worry too much if you get your paint down in sort of the crevices between the armor segments uh, just you know try roughly to aim for hitting the right places where you want that highlight but don't get uh, too concerned about it uh, obviously when it comes to the wings you just want to sort of focus along the top of each of those bits kind of pick them carefully out same with the helmet and any little individual bits that you see. And when you've got larger areas like his shoulder plates and his gauntlets, you're gonna wanna try to apply the li sort of lighter colors of metal that we're gonna be basically putting on from this point forward uh, towards the tops and then sort of uh, blending them out going down so that you get a look of a little bit of shadow uh, sort of under his arms and places like that. So here's why you didn't really need to worry too much if you got some of the lighter colors down in the crevices, and that's because we're going to be applying a known oil wash here. Uh, that really just helps uh, really add definition to a lot of the areas, particularly all those bits around the wings and stuff where you've got all that fine sculpted detail, but also areas uh, underneath the armor plates and the sword and under his arms and anywhere where you want shadow. You can be a little selective with this. You don't have to just slop it on really thick everywhere. You can sort of focus it on more of the areas where you know you need that extra contrast or that extra shadow and leave the other areas alone. And you can even then build up a couple layers in some of those areas where you really want like extreme shadows, say under his arms, for example. Once that uh, wash is dry, you want to go back over everything again with just the pure gunmetal, and that's just going to help relighten any areas that got uh, too dark from your wash. That's going to happen. And from now on, obviously, since the wash is on there, you want to be real, real careful not to get your light colors down in the recesses and crevices anymore. You really want to just hit the surfaces. So, you know, this again requires a bit of good brush control. You really need to make sure your paint is smooth, it flows easily, and that you're using a very small brush. But you really want to make sure you carefully pick out like the fingers and individual bits of his gloves here and all that thing. Uh, one thing I found really helpful while I was working on this part is uh, to employ some of that black glaze that I had left over from the cloak. Uh, one nice thing about glaze is it doesn't dry very quickly. It'll stay wet on your palette for a long time, so you've kind of always got some, and you can always just add a little bit more water if it's not flowing well. But uh, I often 
went ahead and took some of that black glaze if I made a mistake got light colors where I didn't want it and just kind of applied it down into the cracks or recesses to sort of re-darken and define those areas. Uh, sometimes working with glaze is actually easier when you want to add sort of those darker outlining or sort of bits in your armor and that's just because it, in many ways it's easier to control where it goes and wash. It doesn't flow everywhere, it doesn't puddle. You can just put it where you want and if you get it on a part of the metal you don't want, you can really easily sort of wipe it away with the brush so that it only really stays down in the cracks. So if you're struggling sort of to get the outlining and the dark sort of uh, uh, definition in your armor plating, I recommend you do uh, give the, uh, the, the black glaze a, gl a go and see if you, uh, you know, get sort of a better sense of control from using that. I'm then going to add some final bright highlights to the armor, first with a mixture of gunmetal and Vallejo Air Silver. You don't want too much silver in there to start because it'll be too brilliant. And then also a final high highlight of just pure silver. Um, you want to really apply these colors to select areas where you really want to emphasize a lot of shininess uh, on the um, armor and on the sword. The bright silver, just the pure silver by itself in particular, I'd really reserve for places like the sword blade and the helmet and just a few areas where you really want there to be a lot of light hitting and keep it nice and thin. And it really helps, especially when you're doing this really bright work, to keep some of that black glaze handy that I talked about before because you can use it to fix any mistakes if you get that light bright color where you don't want it down in the recesses. You can just really quickly clean it up. Uh, and there's probably going to be areas while you're painting here too that you just generally think need to be neatened up and smooth and just need extra dark definition. So having that black paint there helps while you're working. Now at this stage after you've painted the sort of shiny metal bits the armor is still going to look a little bit messy and that's because it's supposed to have some areas of gold trim on it. Uh, these are very thin and very fiddly. Uh, you can see mostly where they are in the sculpting and if you want to know how it's supposed to look you're going to have to also consult uh, some movie stills probably to figure out where the gold detailing goes but th those sort of things are not too hard to find online. Uh, so what I'm doing now is I'm taking some Vallejo German Camouflage Black Brown and I'm going to be carefully fine lining and base coating all the sort of areas where I want there to be gold trim on the armor. And I'm also going to use this as a base coat for the leather areas. There are a few here like his uh, boots and also his fairly complicated series of belts that he's got on around his waist. I'm now going to apply the sort of first highlight to the gold areas on the armor. I'm using just the Vallejo Air or the sort of the Vallejo metallic gold paint. It comes in the big bottle. You can see it uh, in the first shot of this film. Uh, this paint is really, really nice and thin and flows really well right out of the bottle. So you probably won't even need to thin it at all. And it's very, very pigmented. Uh, so again, I've got a real small brush here and I'm just going to go in very, very carefully. And this takes such uh, such care and such a steady hand because this gold is such a strong pigment and color it, it really tends to almost flow more than you want it to and go on really hard so this to make this look good you need some really good brush control but I'm just basically going to go back over all those areas where you've got the gold which are mostly these sort of fine sort of edging bits along the, the sort of individual pieces of armor. Uh, it's best when you apply these stripes to make sure that you st sort of still have sort of a dark line between the gold and the silver for contrast. Uh, so if you can't control your brush well enough to sort of leave some of that dark base showing sort of along the edge, then you're probably going to want to keep some of your German camouflage black brown handy, either by itself or mixed into a glaze uh, that you can then go ahead and run along uh, the edge to make sure there's a, sort of a dividing line there and also just to clean things up again like when we were painting the armor it's helpful to have something like that a dark color to sort of neaten up your shiny areas and make sure you have a clean smooth uh, thin looking line uh, because usually um, these, these, these gold trim areas are not going to look great if you let them get too wide and too thick, whereas adding sort of a dark uh, line on the outside edge of them is, is not going to make them look so wide or quite so distracting.
And next I mix some of the Vallejo Air Silver with some of that gold paint uh, to get sort of a silvery gold color, I guess you could say. And I'm going to use that now to just, in very few, very uh, sort of selected areas on the gold trim, I'm just going to lightly apply some of that. And that just looks like it's even more shiny and spectacular. And you've got some places where it's very clear that a bit of light uh, is hitting the uh, gold. And if you wanted to do an even better job in this, you, instead of applying uh, just the pure gold like we did in last step, you could have applied an intermediary, so slightly darker gold uh, la layer first and just build up more, uh, basically more levels of highlight. But I was in a little bit of a hurry and I didn't want to get too fussy. Now I'm going to finish off the leather areas on the model, so his belt and boots. Uh, I already applied that base coat of German Camouflage Black Brown, so now I'm going to make a 50-50 mix of the German Camouflage Black Brown and the Vallejo Saddle Brown, and I'm going to go back over and sort of just uh, pretty much go over all of the areas of the leather, though leaving sort of the, the base coat down in some of the darker cracks and sort of areas where there's going to be sort of extreme shadow appearing. Once I've done that, I'm then going to go grab some pure uh, saddle brown and go back over the areas again, uh, applying it sort of just to the areas where I'm going to know I'll want more highlights in the leather and sort of just blending it out uh, into those darker shades. Again, with leather, you want to maintain some of that really dark tone along with some of the lighter areas too. So don't go too heavy with this shade and don't, you know, apply it strongly in some areas, but don't apply it really heavily everywhere. I'm then going to make some high highlights to finish off the leather. I, I first took the saddle brown and mixed some Iraqi sand into that. And you can see I'm using that as sort of a light uh, edge highlight, on, especially on the belt and also even some areas in the, sort of the middle of some of those leather segments to make it look like they're shinier and there's some light hitting. And on the boots too, I'm going to build up some of these lighter colors, especially on the toes, because it looks like there's more wear and also those areas have the most light hitting them. Just get, you know, just get some different tones in the leather. Uh, you want this color in here, but as always with the lighter shades, keep it sparing and make sure you keep that dark color as well. If you want, you can finish off then just with some uh, pure Iraqi sand. I like to do that. I didn't really use that on the boots because those areas don't really need a lighter color, but uh, it was really helpful uh, on those belts just to add a very thin edge highlight in a few places because it just makes it look a little bit shinier and just more polished and it'll just give you a slightly uh, nicer finish result and it really won't take much to sort of give it that extra boost. Okay, so here is the finished model of Ellendale. Uh, I had a pretty good time painting this model. Uh, I'm really pleased with how that black cloak came out particularly. Um, I think it's nice and subtle, but there's still definitely some contrast and some different shades uh, in there. And really uh, working with black glaze, I think is really enormously helpful when you've got sort of big areas of black fabric to paint. So I think that was really good practice. Um, otherwise, yeah, the armor is okay, I guess. I'm not super happy with how that turned out. It's because um, the Lord of the Rings figures, uh, unlike the rest of the sort of Games Workshop models, tend to be a more realistic scale, not so heroic. So, um, you know, you've got these smaller proportions, just finer details to work with. So painting uh, very sort of detailed uh, things like uh, sort of complex fantasy armor gets kind of hard at that scale and it's you know just getting a nice smooth result and good differentiation between the areas without it looking rough can be real tricky and you know working with true metallic paints can make that harder because it's a little bit more difficult to control than um, normal paints and getting sort of that sort of subtle transitions with it is it's a little bit more work everything tends to just be more black and white you know it's more binary I think with these sort of true metallic paints and you have to do more stuff with like black outlining and stuff that you wouldn't really have to do quite as much with normal paints so if I tackle a model like this again I might like to try it with non-metallic metals even though that would be more work uh, it's possible or I think it might maybe uh, give better results in the end I don't know but it would be a fun experiment so anyway I hope you got something useful out of this video anyway and that you enjoyed watching it um, of course, if you did like the video, click the like button down below, uh, share it, uh, leave me comments, of course, to let me know exactly what you thought, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel, 
uh, if you're enjoying this kind of content so you can see what I produce in the future. So that's all for now, and I'll see you next time.